After the wolf became extinct in Britain, the badger became Britain's largest native carnivore. Yet that hasn't stopped people claiming the existence of mysterious British big cats in the countryside, which are also referred to as alien big cats. Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowd note the existence of some 304 press items from 31 counties in 1997 alone about such cats. They're usually described as panthers, black cats or pumas, and it is true that big cats such as pumas and lynxes have been caught over the years. But it's believed individual animals that have been caught are animals that have been kept illegally, which have either escaped or been released. One theory is that they will be survivors of the Ice Age since leopards and other such cats were believed to have existed in Britain. Other people think that the witnesses have just seen domestic cats and misinterpreted what they saw. Are they fact or are they fiction? Let's have a look at the phenomenon of British big cats in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I trust that your June is treating you well, even though things may be slightly different in terms of what you'd planned following next Monday if you are in the UK. Should point out that even though Monday isn't going to mark so-called Freedom Day, as the press dubbed it, it is the summer solstice, so you can at least enjoy that. And then Midsummer Day itself is believed to be on the 24th next week, so there is an episode about that on the podcast and I will link to that below if you would like to do something for Midsummer instead. Now we are otherwise continuing our strange miscellany month as I've dubbed June so we've so far looked at the folklore of strange place names and we've also looked at folklore around time and this week we're doing British Big Cats which was actually a request by two listeners using the request form which is linked below if you're interested and next week is also going to be another request episode again via the request form which is about magpies and magpie rhymes but as I say this week we are going to have a look at British Big Cats which are also known as alien big cats and This is a bit of a bumper episode because there was so much research to find. So I'm just going to dive straight in. And obviously I did put the introduction at the beginning about these animals. And you might be wondering, what exactly are these sightings of these British big cats? Well, the British Big Cat Society, based at Dartmoor Wildlife Park, actually gather evidence and sightings. And even they admit that people do create hoaxes and make genuine mistakes. But there have been, apparently, sightings for more than 250 years. One of the earlier ones that we have on record is William Cobbett, who saw a large cat at Waverley Abbey near Farnborough in the 1760s. And in one of his books, he actually talks about this. And he describes, and I quote, An old elm tree which was hollow even then into which I, when a very little boy, once saw a cat go that was as big as a middle-sized spaniel dog, end quote. Now, Cobbett was actually subsequently scolded and beaten for reporting the sighting, but he remained firm in his conviction that he had indeed seen the cat. And later in life, he saw the great wild grey cat in New Brunswick, which he described as being the same kind of cat that he'd seen at Waverley. Now, that gives you a flavour for the way that these sightings usually work. And there are a range of type of sightings and witnesses might not even specifically identify the animal, but just say it was a big cat. And other people might stress what it is not, saying it was definitely not a dog. And these latter examples preempt questioning or criticism as to the likelihood that someone actually saw a tiger out for a stroll in suburban Sunderland. Now, Michael Goss notes that the descriptions vary so much, the only common points that you can find in these sighting reports are that the animal is cat-like and larger than normal domestic cats, which does leave quite a large berth for what kind of cats they may be. Now, some of the more famous examples of British big cats include the Surrey Puma in 1962-6 and the Black Beast of Exmoor in 1983. Perhaps the most famous of all of them is probably the Beast of Bodmin Moor, which happened between 1994 and 1995. Now, the Ministry of Agriculture actually investigated the Bodmin case and it fell apart under such inspection. Incidentally, one of my beloved friends, when I was telling her that I was doing this episode, actually said that she'd stayed on Bodmin Moor about 20 or so years ago and the particular place where they were staying had a pet cat. I say pet cat. Apparently, it was a metre long from nose to tail. Very, very friendly 
and basically used to roam about the place and it would be quite easy if you saw such an animal to mistake it for a large big cat or indeed a small one from a distance. So it is entirely possible that the beast of Bodmin Moor might have actually been a black cat called Bogbrush. Now we're going to fast forward slightly to 2005 and a six foot man was attacked by a black cat the size of a Labrador and the attack actually left him scratched all over with the cat nicknamed the Beast of Sydenham. In this particular instance he actually saw the cat pinning his pet cat to the ground and it was when he went out that the black cat then went for him. Meanwhile the apparent Beast of Dartmoor believed to have been a black panther was supposedly seen by 15 people in 2011 and in August 2012 the Essex Lion made the news and witnesses supposedly saw it from a caravan park while others claimed to have seen a lion roaring. Now a search was made but nothing was found and no animals had escaped from Colchester Zoo. However I remember this particular incident because my favourite part about it was the fact that the Essex Lion already had a Twitter account mere hours after the story broke hooray for twitter now in 2013 two sisters saw a large black cat jumping a fence on the shropshire wrexham border and then they actually investigated and found a lair and paw prints that were too big to be a cat but too small to be a panther and that include this one because in 1989 an asian jungle cat was actually found on a shropshire roadside that had been hit by a car so for some people this was actually the ancestor of the more recently sighted cats and incidentally there is even a website where you can find the places where you're most likely to spot a big cat in north North Wales and I have linked that in the show notes. In April 2019 witnesses spotted a big cat in the Cornish village of Harrow Barrow and it apparently attacked a dog. It also left a paw print that the RSPCA identified as possibly being that of a panther. So I include all of these to give you an idea of the kind of sightings and I've included the more recent ones because obviously the news coverage is a lot easier to find and it is also just the fact I think it's a bit more interesting that this isn't a thing that was going on in like the 40s or 50s this is a thing that like was even being reported like two years ago and actually even more recently than that which is quite interesting I think particularly with the amount of technology that we have surveilling basically everywhere that we are and I did want to include one because you sort of go "Ooh, a lot of these stories are about people who seem to see something and I did want to include an actual sighting that turned up a genuine cat in the late 90s and early noughties and this one was dubbed the Beast of Barnet and the sightings clustered in North London and eventually someone spotted a lynx in a garden in Cricklewood in May 2001 and obviously I think lynx are actually quite distinctive big cats in a lot of ways particularly sort of with the tufty ears and everything but authorities actually believe that the lynx had been kept illegally and had escaped. Now they did actually manage to catch this one and it ended up in London Zoo with a broken paw and it was suffering from malnutrition. So far that sounds quite awful but thankfully the story ends on a positive note and eventually this particular lynx was actually transferred to a zoo in France in 2004 where she was placed with a mate and had cubs. So hopefully she had a slightly better existence after that point. And indeed another lynx actually escaped, this time from a Welsh zoo in 2017. So there are some cases where they are actually genuinely animals that have actually escaped. But what evidence is there along with these reports of sightings? Because so far we've just talked about what people have said they've seen, apart from obviously the actual cat that turned up. I mean, that's pretty good evidence. But what other evidence is there? Now, there is some video footage, but the problem is it's nearly always blurry and taken from quite far away. And it's often difficult due to the scale to work out if you're looking at a really large house cat or an actual big cat, because it's not always clear with the surroundings. It's also quite difficult to definitively explain what you're looking at. Animals are sometimes shot and killed, which does provide more concrete evidence, although this is a lot more rare in recent years. And sightings are often brief, sometimes they're at night or they are from a distance. So all of these things make it a little bit more difficult to actually go, yes, for definite, this thing is real. And as an example, in 2011, Durham University did DNA testing on hairs that were found in North Devon that were believed to belong to a leopard. That said, fact check at Channel 4 pointed out that while Durham University confirmed that the hairs were probably from a leopard, there was no way to prove that they were actually found in Devon. Meanwhile, DNA testing in 2012 on two deer carcasses from Gloucestershire ended up just showing fox DNA, although locals continued to blame a big cat. Now, conclusive evidence has come from tooth marks left on predated animals in West Wales, where scientists have concluded that they came from a cat much larger than a domestic cat, although no species has been specified. Now, Samantha Hearn actually claimed that a colleague had performed analyses on dead animals in West Wales, 
and the results indicated their deaths at the claws of large felids similar in size and habit to leopards. But that said, Goss does discuss the fact that sheep killing isn't an unprecedented thing, because in the 19th and early 20th centuries, beasts or wolves were blamed for killing sheep at night, and now big cats get the blame. Ultimately, it is usually difficult for anyone to produce physical evidence. And yes, you get the occasional paw print or you do get these dead animals and so on, although there's no way of knowing what actually killed them. And even if it was a real big cat, you would think it would have left droppings or paw prints somewhere. They're also not immortal. And as far as I can tell, no one has ever actually stumbled across a big cat in the wild that died of natural causes. So you would think that there would be somewhere that you would come across an animal that had just died of old age. Now, true, that is the case of the Asian leopard cat, which was shot near Widdicombe on Dartmoor in April 1988. But again, that was obviously, that was not natural causes. Meanwhile, and I did want to include this one as well, a series of puma sightings in Cannock Invernessia in October 1980 did actually lead to the capture of a tame six-year-old puma. But these are isolated cases and don't prove the existence of a colony of big cats in the wild because obviously the puma was tame, therefore had been around humans before. And this does explain one of the theories that they're more likely an offshoot of the introduction of the Dangerous Wild Animals Act in 1976. Because before this point, it had actually been legal to keep big cats as pets. But then after the act came in, it then meant that you had to have a whole load of other requirements and licenses and all that kind of thing. And basically people then just released their animals or they escaped or whatever, rather than having to go through all the the paperwork and everything that they needed to keep them. Now, Goss does point to the sighting recorded by William Cobbett because natural history was a hugely popular pastime in the Victorian era and people didn't need to be professional scientists to take part. And as Goss says, and I quote, the hunt for new species was relentless. If a British big cat had been out there, they would surely have found it, end quote. Naturally, as I said before, hoaxes can and do occur because a skull turned up on Bodmin Moor in 1995 and on closer inspection, it came from a leopard skin rug. Elsewhere, cuddly toys and even cardboard cutouts have been used to fake photographic evidence. And if you actually go and have a look at my blog post for this episode, there is indeed a one that I had to go out with the stuffed panther that I've got. Now further, domestic cats even stand in for these alien big cats at times because some photos use angles that deliberately distort or obscure the size of the cat. So let's briefly turn to that other source of evidence that is often overlooked. Surely, if big cats were thought a genuine threat, they would make their way into folklore. But even this proves a dead end, because as Goss points out, there are magic cats, talking cats, supernatural cats in both British fairy tales and folklore, but nothing apparently monstrous. Dick Whittington's cat is exactly that, a cat. If a cat is thought dangerous in a British tale, it's more likely as a witch's familiar than a terrifying big cat on the loose. True, not all stories were written down, but you'd imagine more legends would abound if there had been enough tales to make an impression on people. So Goss actually points to the work of Jeremy Hart, who tried to draw a link between big cat sightings and the black dogs of folklore. Now, while these sightings and legends were once common, they do appear relatively scarce now. So the theory goes, perhaps the big cat has taken the place of the spectral black dog. Now, Goss also refers to Di Francis, who suggests that black dogs were actually misidentified black cats, a species proposed to have survived from the Ice Age. Now, Goss himself disagrees, and it is quite clear from many of the black dog stories that they definitively mean black dogs. So in this theory, the supernatural part of the black dog has been forgotten, and that's been essentially shoved to one side in favour of the escape wildcat explanation. I don't find that particularly satisfying, I must admit. George Munger goes one step further and actually proposes that these big cat stories, and I quote, are part of a long tradition of encounters with non-native or unfamiliar animals which were perceived and described as fantastic beasts, end quote. And in this approach, non-native animals are more believable than fantastical creatures like dragons. Of course, this theory falls apart when you get into the internet age because people know what big cats look like. And while they're certainly non-native, calling them unfamiliar is stretching things a bit. No one is saying that big cats don't exist. It's just difficult to find proof that they exist here. So what explanations are there for these stories? Well, there are four main theories and we've touched on a couple of them as we've been going through this episode. But two of them are also far more likely than the others. One of the more probable explanations is that these British big cats are escapees or releases from captivity because of the 1976 Act. 
And obviously, like I say, people could keep all kinds of animals as pets before 1976. And when the Dangerous and Wild Animals Act came along, new welfare and safety rules came in. So some people obviously released the cats rather than adhering to the requirements. Whether animals previously kept in captivity would be able to cope in the wild is another question indeed. There is another popular theory that people misidentify other animals such as foxes, dogs and feral cats. Less likely is the theory that Britain has an indigenous population of big cats that have so far managed to elude any kind of serious observation. Now, yes, it is true, and I do have to point this out, that big cats are incredibly elusive and they are incredibly difficult to study in the wild. However, the British Isles are actually quite small and we do have quite a dense population. So how likely is it that the islands could sustain a breeding population of big cats without people just stumbling across them more regularly? And the most unlikely theory is the idea that there might be thought forms or symbolic expressions of environmental consciousness. Now, there are obviously quite a lot of stories and talk at the moment about things like land spirits, but would they take the form of a non-indigenous black panther? Probably not. But who's to say? I don't know. Maybe you've got a theory on this yourself. Now, are these stories basically fed by the media? Because that is, of course, the other thing that we do need to bear in mind. And Goss notices that stories in the past have often been short, matter-of-fact pieces in the newspapers. They're often considered curiosity items and, and I quote, the typical alien big cat story, like the animal upon which it is founded, appears as if from nowhere and vanishes just as rapidly with the skill and finality of a ghost, end quote. So stories often also make reference to other sightings over the years to situate the most recent sighting into a historical context. And the idea that sightings aren't one-off events gives them a bit of a weird sense of credibility. This means that people can essentially put more weight in their belief. Even when there is no evidence this time, you can point to the other sightings as a backup. People do often express fear towards the threat to children in particular and often claim that they want to hunt down and kill said big cat. But that said, the stories don't really involve the cats physically attacking children. And one of the few stories involving a cat attacking a human actually happened in 2019, obviously other than the Beast of Sydenham. And in the 2019 story, a man in Cornwall claimed that a six foot black cat attacked him through a window. And in his story, it was a cross between a panther and a domestic cat, although he also said that the police weren't interested and didn't investigate. So this does naturally make it difficult to know how genuine it is as a story. And we even see similar tales outside of the British Isles. So we're calling them British big cats, but we do get them elsewhere in Europe because there was a Bagheera panic in Rome in early 1990 when parents thought an escaped pet panther was on the loose and apparently kept their children indoors. The story did migrate north to Florence and Milan, and despite the Italian backdrop, the sightings bore an uncanny resemblance to the British variety. And obviously France had its own big cat sightings in the 1980s, and Goss describes this as an updating of their older tradition of wolf sightings. So why do the stories persist in the British Isles? Well, it could well be simply because we don't have any large wild animals, because our largest animals are red deer, and you wouldn't necessarily want to face one down, but they're not not—they're not a predator, you know what I mean? They are not something that is intrinsically dangerous to people. And we don't have any predators that are naturally dangerous to humans. I mean, we've only got like two snakes, I think, and one of them's the adder. And yes, it is venomous, but it's not exactly the black mamba. And it's basically, Goss suggests that the big cat sightings fulfil a need to feel threatened by something bigger than us. And it's a slightly strange view when you consider that humans and big cats do coexist in many other parts of the world with few to no attacks on humans. So Goss also suggests that some writers think that the big cat points to an unconscious desire to live in a less urbanised environment. Jan Hool suggested it's their mystery. We don't know how they got here or how long they've been here. Although she explains the truth is probably far more mundane, you do have that idea of, like the quote from Predator, there's something alive out there and it ain't no man. It's kind of the same sort of thing, except obviously applied to a big cat rather than a predator. Now, of course, part of the issue is that some of these sightings are genuine. Animals can and do escape, and they rightly capture the imagination when these stories appear in the press. And the thing is, ultimately, no one is debating whether big cats are real, because they quite clearly are. It's just whether they live in the wild in Britain, because we know that they do live in Britain because they are in zoos. But do they live in the wild? That's the question. And given how elusive they are in the rest of the world, as Hearn points out, is it possible that they are here, they're just really elusive? Because as Goss points out, since some of the stories do involve real animals, it's really difficult to refer to them as as a whole, as a legend. 
yet the sightings do appear as a form of contemporary folklore, since the sightings are sometimes more about the myth of the big cat than their reality. So what do you think? Do you think that we genuinely have a breeding population of big cats living in the British Isles? Have you seen one? If you have, please do send me an email, tweet me, whatever, because I'd love to know how many people have actually seen one of these things for real. I'm not going to poo-pooed or anything. I'm just genuinely curious. Have you actually seen one of these British big cats and just maybe never realised what it was up until now? please do feel free to let me know. Obviously, the British Big Cat Society would love to know as well because they do collect and investigate sightings. So that was this week's episode. I hope that you found that fun. It was actually quite a lot of fun to research and I sort of felt awful re- like doing the whole thing, going like, no, these can't possibly be real. And just, you know, pouring cold water on the theory about them having lived here since the Ice Age. But that that is what happens when you do your research. Sometimes you find out that things aren't actually as cool as they first sounded. But the British big cats are still a really interesting concept, nonetheless. So that is the end of this week's episode. Like I say, next week we are going to be having a look at magpies, and particularly magpie rhymes, because there are various versions, as I discovered once on Twitter during Folklore Thursday. If you are a Patreon supporter at the 350 or more a month tier, you will be getting the bonus episode next week, which is on sort of profits and seers and things like that. And if you are also at the £5 a month or higher tier, we are doing the illustrated talk this month and that is on Victorian morning etiquette. So expect like hair, jewellery and strange customs around preparing for burial, but also like how you behaved actually in order to mourn. So that's going to be nice and goth for June because that's how we do things here on Fabulous Folklore. But without any further ado, I hope that you have an absolutely fantastic midsummer. And I hope to see you next week for magpies and so on. So without any further ado, I shall let you go and I will see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next. Bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.